Good morning. It's awesome to see everybody here this morning. Um, it was back in 2015. I was living up in Minneapolis. Uh, my wife and I had just had our first son, and we were getting ready to make the transition back uh, to Milwaukee. Uh, I was working in the, uh, for my friend's tea company, which is probably part of the reason why I have this up here this morning. Um, but I was looking to get back into ministry, and I, I didn't know how much money I would be making in ministry, but as a guy in his mid 20s going back into ministry, I figured probably not that much money. Uh, and so we were looking for places to live, and we thought $1,000 would be a pretty safe budget for like a rent, for an apartment, for a place that we could live. Um, and so we were looking around, we really weren't finding all that much in our price range in Milwaukee. It just seemed like everything was out of our price range or just didn't meet what we needed. Um, but we found a place that was a small house. It was updated really nicely. It looked great. Like, it wasn't big, but it was exactly what we needed. It was $700 a month. It was, like, perfect. It was like, okay, this is great. So we messaged the person who owned this place, and as we started talking to this person, they said, yeah, you know, there's a lot of people interested right now, uh, but if you want to get your foot in the door and get to the front of the line, you can uh, give us the $700 uh, security deposit, and that'll hold your place in line. Now, normally this is not the way you would do things. Normally you would go and you'd visit and you'd look at the place and you'd meet the person. You'd make sure that this was right. But we, we just were having no luck with finding a place. And at that point we were like, okay, yeah, you know what? We're five hours away. Let's just send the money over, get our foot in the door. We'll have a place to live. Perfect. I see the, the, the variety of faces. There's people smiling. There's people grimacing right now. You guys kind of already know what's happening. Uh, we felt this pressure, <clears throat> uh, and we just thought we have to do this. And so we sent the money off. We assumed we could trust this person. We thought we were ready to, to go in on this new place to live. But of course, we found that the person we were talking to doesn't live in Milwaukee. They don't even live in the country. In fact, they don't even own the place that, that we were talking about at all. And ultimately, a few weeks later, I'm talking to a police detective, and she just told me flat out, yeah, there's like over a dozen people who fell for this scam. You know, like, you're not the only one. There's nothing that we can do about it. And we were out 700 bucks. And honestly, it could have been like a whole lot worse. It could have been $7,000. It could have been $70,000. It wasn't. It was just 700. It's still a lot of money. Were we stupid? Yes. Were we young? Yeah, we were young and stupid. Uh, but we also learned something pretty important that has served us really well, and I think it will continue to serve us into the future, which is if you, with how technology is today, if you don't know who you're talking to, that's not a good thing. If you don't know who you're talking to, unless you actually know who you're talking to, you have to know who is on the other side of a phone conversation or, or an email correspondence. And I wonder if that's happened to you, something like that has happened to you, or probably, maybe it wasn't completely that, but maybe it was like a phone call. Do you guys get these phone calls where either there's like silence right at the beginning, or there's people who start asking you questions about like your financial life or about your medical history or bills, and you're like, wait, where did this call come from? All of a sudden, I'm being asked all of these questions that I wasn't, like, why is this happening? If you're not careful, you start just handing out personal information about yourself to somebody who you think you, you know, they say that they're from a certain company that maybe you have a, an interaction with, but how, how do you know that that person is actually that person? And so for a lot of us in the room, but I, I would say especially people of, of my generation, we've formed a habit where we just don't answer the phone anymore, right? Or if it's like silent for more than two seconds, I'm just boom, like I just hang it up immediately. Uh, we just stop doing that, which can be kind of problematic for some of us. So for some of us in our line of work, like if you're a real estate agent, you're probably used to answering every single phone call, right? Because you have to be able to connect people that you don't have their number saved in your phone. For me, I used to be a youth pastor. I will still have students who text me and say, hey, can, can I use you as a reference for a job? And I'll always be like, oh yeah, great. Sure. 
Well, it's a problem if you're a reference for a job and you never pick up your phone. <laughs> because when the, when the place calls you to get that reference, you know, I'm not picking up. But because of this environment of, of not knowing the identity of the person on the other side of the phone call, it's, it's formed this response in us, right? It's formed this response in me of just shutting myself off from the world because I just can't trust a person until I've gotten to know that person. So it's not very helpful. It's not very helpful a lot of the times. But considering our world, considering the actual discord and the actual chaos of our world, there's actually good reasons to be careful. Because most people, a lot of these people, just want to figure out a way, how can I get into this person's bank account, right? So can anyone really blame us for being like this? And so now we live with this normal response to question everyone. We question everyone. We start from a place of distrust, and we assume the worst until proven otherwise, right? And my parents always told me to, to assume the best. Well, now I think we live in such a culture where, where for a lot of us, we have to be, have our guards up. We have to assume the worst. And yet there's a problem with living in that state of a hypervigilance all the time, and it's because that sort of a mindset, it's a lot harder to turn off than we think. It's a lot harder to just flip that switch and turn that part of our brain and start trusting people that we should trust if we're being hypervigilant all the time. And if we're not careful, and I know that you might not think that this is true, but, but it could start to happen with our relationship with God. We get so used to trusting no one, to never putting our guard down, and what if we never put our guard down and learn to trust God? Because we've become so accustomed to hearing about pain. I mean, even in the church, right? Even in Christian circles, even with people who we, we wanted to trust, who, who we wanted to believe, who, who we wanted to have a good relationship with, a lot of us have been burned at some point in time as well, right? And so that can start to have a hardening effect on our hearts, not only towards those people, not only towards the church, but in some cases, even towards Jesus and God. Uh, some of my friends have asked me in the past, because I, I've had a lot of these moments happen in, in my life, in my church life, and they're just amazed. They're like, how do you keep following Jesus and being a part of the church when you've had so many hard things happen within the church? And, and I can remember, even as a teenager, having to deal with that question. You know what my response always has been? As I thought about it, I just thought, well, none of that had anything to do with Jesus. And I don't say that flippantly. I don't, I don't try to say that in a really like nonchalant way. I really mean it. I mean, I, I recognize that pain and brokenness happens, and none of that actually had to do with Jesus. It just had to do with that person. But how do we get there? Because it's not always so easy to get there in our hearts where we really believe that. How do we get there? I think we get there by knowing Jesus intimately, by knowing who he is, and by knowing who he is not, by knowing his nature and knowing when a false voice is pretending to be him, we can start to learn to trust his identity and his nature as we get to know him more. So, people, buckle up. Open up your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. This is one of the most intense parts of the whole of the Bible. So just open up to Colossians 1, um, verses 15 through 20. Um, what we're going to read in this passage is this deep, intense, full of wisdom and truth passage that is so packed. It might feel like a really wild ride, but let me promise you, it is a really, really good ride. So are you guys ready? Let's read it together. Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20. I'm just going to read the whole passage. It says this. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, 
and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Would you pray with me? God, we want to come to know you more. I know we say that a lot, but we actually want to know you. We need the eyes of our hearts to be opened so that we can understand you and learn to love you more. I pray that you would do that this morning in your son's holy and powerful name. Amen. All right, now you should be noticing something as we read this passage that right off the bat, Paul, he's transitioning. So prior, two weeks ago, we, had, we talked all about hope and this community of hope. And then last week, Steve, he, he talked about this community of prayer. He, it was just amazing last week. Um, and this week, Paul is changing that and he is zooming out and he's giving us this broad, wide picture about who Jesus is, about his identity. Now, there's lots of ways you can talk about someone's identity. In the Gospels, they do it in a bunch of different ways. They talk about Jesus as a baby. They talk about Jesus as a child. They talk about Jesus as a man. And undoubtedly, the people in Colossae, they probably had heard a lot of those stories about who Jesus is. They might have even heard all of those stories about who Jesus is. But Paul chooses not to talk about any of those things at the onset of this letter. It, rather, he, he chooses to talk about Jesus in a really unexpected way because he equates Jesus the man with Jesus the eternal, uncreated God. He, he equates Jesus to the uncreated God. He actually speaks of Jesus in language, incorporating him into the creation of the universe and of our world. And if that sounds like a lot, it is a lot. If for any of you who have spent any time watching programs, about, uh, science programs about the size of our universe, or if you've spent any time thinking about that, and now we're reading all of this language about Jesus who holds it all together and it's all in him, and it's talking about Jesus is beyond and bigger than all of that, that is a lot to take in. But it's the filter through which Paul wishes us to understand who Jesus is. It's similar to how John does it. If you've ever read the beginning of John's gospel, it's, it, it feels different than the other gospels. And that's because John starts his gospel not with Jesus' birth, not with long lists of genealogy, but rather he starts in eternity in the presence of God. So we see Jesus' nature, his identity, presented in three ways in the text this morning. The, the first way we see Jesus' nature presented is that all things were created in him. We're going to see that Jesus is a reflection of Jesus and that, and that Jesus is a reflection of God. Sorry, I think I said that wrong, but Jesus is, is a reflection of God. So here's what it says in verse uh, 15. It says, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, you, you, this should sound kind of familiar, right? Because it says this in verse 27. It says that God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So if you can get this picture of Jesus reflecting God and us reflecting Jesus, it's like, it's like two mirrors that are reflecting each other. And you somehow see parts of God when we look at humanity, but we see God clearly when we look at Jesus. And so when we start to ask this question, like, who is Jesus? We get our answer right away. He's the exact image, or he's the exact reflection of God himself. Uh, one commentator used a really good analogy. Imagine yourself sitting in a room, and there's, it's like an office, so there's just a doorway and God is sitting out in the hallway, and you can't see him because he's around the corner, and you can't see God. And you're looking through the doorway, and Jesus is like a mirror that sits in the hallway, and you can see it through the doorway, and it's reflected on just the right angle so that when you look at the mirror, you can see God clearly. 
And that's who Jesus is. He's the image of the invisible God. And when we're looking at Jesus, we're looking at God. So if that's true, when we look at Genesis 1 now, it begins to make more sense in light of Colossians. It says, in him all things were created. He's the image of God, but he's also the container. It's all held within him. Now, I have this tea up here this morning, and I swear I'm, I'm trying to do something more than just have fun, even though this is some of the most fun that I have is brewing tea. Uh, this is <clears throat> called Gung Fu Tea, which sounds a lot fancier than it is. That literally just means free time. So it's tea that you make in your free time. Now, we're used to steeping tea for like three to five minutes. In Gung Fu Tea, we just steep it for a few seconds. That's all you need. You'll get the essence of the tea in just a few seconds. And I'm doing something cruel because I'm making the best tea in the world and not offering you any of it. <laughs> but here it is. Now, as we start to look at the tea ceremony, as we start to look at what's going on here with this tea, there's all sorts of relationships happening, right? There's the tea itself, which came from a tree, which came from a place, but it's sitting inside of this tea pot, this brewing vessel, and the water is infusing it, right? The water is starting to get the essence of the tea, and it's being poured into this glass pitcher, and it looks beautiful, doesn't it? There you go. And it's in the glass pitcher. The glass pitcher is holding the tea. Now, I'm not going to try to overanalyze this, but for the simplicity of our illustration this morning, it says that all of creation is being held in Jesus. So we could look at the tea, and we could look at it as if it is all of creation. If this is everything that's ever been created, it's being held in this pitcher. So on the one hand, Jesus is the pitcher which can hold everything which is a very, very deep, hard to understand, very, very like, okay, I'll take your word for it, Paul, kind of a thing. Because it is hard to understand. It's a huge zoom out on the whole of the universe. That's a lot to take in. But very quickly as we think about that, and you might say, okay, I'll, I'll give you that. So Jesus is holding all of creation in his hands, right? Like that old children's song, he's got the whole world in his hands. That's kind of like this. But there's some questions that come up pretty quickly, and Paul deals with one of them pretty quickly. And it's the question of this. is that if God is holding all of creation within himself, if it's true that all, all of creation was created in him, then why does he allow so much brokenness and so much sin to exist in here? Have you ever thought about that? It's kind of like the classic problem, right? Like if God does this, and if he's holding it all together— why does he allow so much brokenness before? Because this can be the barrier that we start to face often in life as we follow Jesus. It's what I mentioned before. It's when hard things happen in the church or with people that we thought we could trust and we found out that we couldn't trust them. And, and if we look at prior to the creation of anything, God already knew that that brokenness would happen. Prior to anything, prior to him creating anything, he already knew that brokenness would be a part of his creation. And so he had to think about what kind of creation he wanted to make. And he thought he would make one that reflected his nature. That is to say that he would make a creation of love itself. That is to say that he would make a creation that's defined and infused, if we want to use a T term, infused with love itself. But true love, the love of God, is inherently non-coercive. It doesn't force you to do anything, does it? Think about in the garden. Remember, God, why did he put that tree in the garden? He had to give you an option to say no. He said, I want to be with you. I want to love you, but I will give you an option to say no. God is always leaving the door open, the possibility open for you to say no because that's what love is. In other words, if you want to experience the true love of God, you need to be vulnerable to rejection. I'm sorry, not for, from God, but from other people, the love from other people. You need to be vulnerable to rejection, to heartbreak and pain, and God himself made himself vulnerable to rejection, heartbreak, and pain 
when he created the world. And God knew this would be the case before he created anything. And that's why it says here in Colossians 1.20, it says that he reconciled all things to himself. In other words, he made a way. He reconciled all things to himself by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Isn't that amazing? Here in this grand cosmic picture of creation being held in Jesus, that he contains it all, is this reality that he created space for imperfect people like you and I making imperfect decisions from the very start. He knew it would happen. He knew that we would rebel and he made a plan. And he offered us a way out of the chaos of rejecting him. And he did it before the first stroke of creation. Now, if you have your Christianity brain on, you might be saying, now, wait a minute. He didn't do it before the first stroke of creation, did he? Didn't he do it 2,000 years ago on the cross? Let me just draw your attention to Revelation 13, 8. It says, the lamb who was slain before the creation of the world. I don't know if you remember that in your reading of scripture, but, but there's a reality in God's reality that, yeah, it happened 2,000 years ago, but according to God, Jesus was sacrificed for you before he did anything else. That's a lot to take in. That's a lot to wrap your mind around. But isn't it good to know that that's who God is? That he, he looked at everything that was going to be created in him, and he called it good, and it reflects who he is, but that he saw the opportunity for sin and brokenness, and he came up with a plan from the very start. He came up with a plan from the very start, before the first stroke of creation. Isn't that amazing? We could just end right there. Except for Paul uh, keeps going, so we're going to keep going. He wants to add one more aspect um, to this idea. It's in verse 17. He says, He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Okay. We've barely started to scratch the surface on understanding what, what does it mean that in him all things hold together? Well, I'll just draw your attention to two very quick things. One is gravity. Think about gravity. If you've ever watched any of those science shows where they try to like, show you what a black hole looks like, and you see light just like bending like a vortex around it, and of course, light can't even escape a black hole. Gravity is one of those things that we experience all the time, and yet from a scientific standpoint, we can't really explain it. We can measure it, but we have no idea why it's there or where it came from. But yet, gravity keeps us in relationship. It holds our solar system together. And it holds our little corner of our galaxy together, which is held in relationship to all the other galaxies around us, is this invisible force that we can hardly even understand. And yet, it all holds together. We can't explain it. We don't know why. We just know that it holds together. You know, scientists used to think, prior to the 20th century, that, that physical reality was very separate from one another. And that's until they started proving this, these new ideas in something called quantum mechanics that showed that everything is actually very related to each other. If you want to have some fun, go look up quantum entanglement later on today. And you will see something that when, um, when a, a subatomic particle can be split, and it could be located. They could put both sides of the particle billions of light years away from each other. And guess what happens? When they spin one half of it, the other half will spin simultaneously, even though it's separated by billions of light years. And if you're like, Nate, this is way too big for me to grasp. Yeah, me too. Join the club. The point is, the mind-boggling interconnectedness of our universe is pointing to something. Einstein put it this way, when he saw that this stuff was true, you know what his response was? I want to know the mind of the creator. He was not a Christian, but he was compelled. It's so connected. It's so perfect. It's, it's all held together. All of this is pointing to something. And if we're wise, we would look at it and say, not something, someone. 
is holding it all together. Paul would say, in him, all things hold together. But not only were all things created in in him. In verse 16, it says that all things were created through him. Now, as we look back at this tea brewing process, um, we can recognize all of these relationships here. So not only is there the container, right, that's holding this tea, but then there's this tea vessel. This is a, an Ishing uh, clay teapot. And the tea is going to flow from the teapot through, through uh, from the tea, through the teapot into the pitcher. And as we think about who Jesus is, we're told that not only does he hold all creation itself, but that creation itself has sprung up. It was generated through himself. In other words, Jesus is life itself. And if it's true that we're reflections of him and that we're full of life and that this creation around us is full of life, then Jesus himself must be the source of life. Uh, This morning, I'm giving you a lot of homework, so here's more homework. You can open up to Proverbs chapter 8 on your own time. We're we're not going to read the whole thing, but in Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 through 31, it's a passage about wisdom with a capital W. It's a passage about divine wisdom. It's about this character that's written about poetically that talks about that God was creating all of the universe through this divine wisdom. Essentially, it was an aspect of God's own nature. Now, the early church grasped onto that when they read Proverbs 8 and they started putting the pieces together of who Jesus was. Guess what they looked at Jesus and said he was? They said Proverbs 8 was talking about him. That, that this force that, that God created through, this divine wisdom was actually Jesus himself. In fact, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, Jesus is the power and the wisdom of God. Now, if you've been a Christian for a while, this might sound like normal. It's information that you've heard or that you already know. But, but take off your Christian glasses for a moment and just think as plainly as possible about this dynamic. That if there is a God, and if that God decided to create a physical reality that we know as the universe, why did he do this whole creating thing in and through Jesus? Right? Like, why, why, didn't, why did he have to use, like, the universe is created through Jesus? Like, why didn't he just do it on his own? Why didn't he do it separate from divine wisdom as a partner, so to, so to speak? And it's a good question, but I think it actually points us back to, to God's true nature, It's because God is a God of relationship and interconnectedness and love. Notice as we read Colossians here, this dynamic relationship between God and Jesus and creation, it's all interconnected. And that makes sense because he wanted to create a universe based on his own love. And he wanted to create created beings like us with the capacity to love. And therefore, just imagine this. He didn't create beings and plop them down in front of him on a chair and say, all right, I'm God, I've created you, now love me. Could you imagine God having done that? He could have. But, but why is that a ridiculous thing to think about? Because that's not really what love is, right? I mean, we see this all the time reflected in our human relationships. Think about back when you were a kid or back when you first started noticing other, other people and you, you liked someone or, or you thought you were interested in someone. Uh, why do we play hard to get? Uh, why, why couldn't you just say, hey, you, I like you, you should like me, end of story. That never happens, does it? Why don't we just come out and say it and, and it's very straightforward? Because love is not demanding like that, is it? Love is not demanding. What do we do instead? We create an environment where we're around each other and we get to know each other and we get to see what the other person is like and we get to see what they create with their minds and what they create with their hands. And maybe, just maybe, we might decide that this person is worth loving, right? And when God created everything, it all flowed through Jesus. That is to say that it's all infused with Jesus himself so that we might seek him and find him and know him and choose to love him. So as we look at all of the creation, the people and the creation around us, here's the question. 
Are your eyes open to Jesus in everything and every one? Are they open to it? We live in a God-infused universe. Did you know that each person was created through him? And they reflect something beautiful about who he is. And when we take a look at this tea, you guys, this tea is so good. It is so amazing. Like, you're going to have to come up and smell it afterwards and maybe taste a little because it's so good. But it, it tells me something about the process that it went through. I mean, I, I can smell it. I know too much information about it. But with most teas, I can just smell it. I can tell you about what part of the country in China it came from. I can tell you about its flavor, its aroma, about its geography, about what type of minerals were in the soil. Because I know a lot about tea. And you guys, as we experience each other in friendship and community, and even as we experience people who we normally might not want to love or even want to like, the more time we spend with Jesus, the more familiar we are with who he is. And the more we're able to identify his presence and his nature in everybody we interact with. Because it was all made in him, and it was all made through him. But that's not all. You thought it's radical so far? It's going to get more radical. It was all made for him. Paul says it was all made for him. I, I've been making tea, and I, I genuinely do feel bad. I'm so used to making tea for people, and we all just enjoy it. And I feel bad because the, the point of tea is not for me to, to stand here and make illustrations and point at it. You know what the point of tea is? To enjoy it. At the end of the day, you, you're drinking it, and you should be enjoying yourself. Uh, the provocative realization that should stir you this morning, this is the thing that if you're taking one thing away this morning, take this away. It, it should reconsider how you live your daily life is the fact that you were made for him. You weren't made for you. You were made for him. You were created and put into enough environments where you could experience his presence which is infused in all creation. You were created and put into enough relationships with friends and families and others where you could experience moments of true beauty and love with other people. And the point isn't just that you'd enjoy it. That is a big part of the point, but it's not the whole point. The point is that you would recognize the thing beneath all of it. That you'd recognize the God behind all of the beautiful moments of your life. You were created for him. And as you enjoy him, you find that he enjoys you as well. Do you know and recognize that God likes you? Some of us have a hard time even liking ourselves. Do you know that God enjoys you? He likes spending time with you. You know, we've gone through a lot of stuff with creation this morning, but that was a lot of work and trouble, all to be for nothing. It's a lot of meaning and purpose in our universe if there's no God behind it. And you know what Jesus says about all of it? He created it for himself. It was created for him. You were created to experience and enjoy him. And as you and God mutually seek each other out, you know what happens? It's that love thing. You start to see the love of God taking place, that he always intended this to be the nature of this beautiful world that he created, this creation of love. You were created for him, and the proof is Jesus himself. It, it says this in verse 20, it says that God was pleased to have his very self, his essence, his fullness, live and dwell in Jesus, the human one. And it was so that we might see his love on display for each of us and so that we might respond to that love, which leads us really to the point of it all. The point is, if this is the reality we live in, if this is the universe and the world that we live in, that if we do live in this creation that is Jesus-shaped and Jesus-filled and Jesus-infused, if we learn to see that and experience that, more and more, then we will continually find more and more that those who follow Jesus can live at peace. You can live at peace. You can live at peace in this world because now when we see brokenness in the world, when things don't go our way, when people take advantage of us, 
we don't have to get angry at God because we see it's just people freely choosing to not respond to this God-infused world. We can be at peace with the world. We can be at peace with ourselves because even when we see brokenness and hurt and pain that we generate, that sin that's in our own lives, even when we see that, we can recognize that we've been healed, but we're still learning how to fully be healed. And we can remind ourselves that we can choose God and his love again and again. We can be at peace with ourselves. Most importantly, we can be at peace with God because peace and reconciliation was a part of his plan before he spoke a word of creation. It says that through Jesus, he reconciled all things. In other words, he made everything right, whether things on earth or in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross for you. And so this is who Jesus is. Isn't that good to know? He's the creator of everything. He, everything was made in him and through him, and it's all for him. And because of that, you can have peace. And yet here we are, church. We're supposed to be the people who bring that message of peace to the world. How many people in our world, how many of us in our lives, we live at war with ourselves and at war with the world and at war with God? And yet we're called to be the bringers of peace. We're, we're called to bring that good news. How often do we forget that we're here, not just for ourselves, we're here for him and we're here for the world. And Paul says it, that Jesus is the head of the church and we're the body. And, and we've, if we've experienced Jesus' peace, like a body, we have work to do then. We have parts that have to go out and do work. We have a mission that's so desperately needed. There are so many who desperately need God's peace and love in their life. We're to remind and proclaim pe to people that knowing Jesus puts all creation at peace. And so that's our invitation today. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. We have an opportunity today to, I, I hope, respond to what God has done. I, I, my hope is that something this morning, I know there was a lot, there's a lot to wrap your mind around with this passage, but that something about Jesus' nature and about God struck you differently this morning. And, and that as we take the bread and we take the cup, we're reminded of the fact that reconciliation and peace was built into the fabric of our world, and now it's on offer for everyone. And, and the proof of this love is Jesus on the cross, broken and poured out for you.